David R. Guttery is the president of Keystone Financial Group in Trustville, Alabama. David Guttery and Brandon Guttery are financial advisors and represent Emeritus Investment Company, LLC. Please stay tuned through the end of the video for additional important disclosure information. Clients and friends, thank you for your attention to today's podcast. Before we get started, let me just say that this will be a rather lengthy podcast. However, I would encourage you all to absorb the information because I will cover each aspect in great detail. For those of you who are clients, you have already seen most of this as we have had individual review meetings. However, if it's been more than a few weeks since our last review meeting, I would suggest to you that the data contained within this podcast has likely changed. Among other things, you invest your trust and confidence in me to be aware of the things that could potentially have an impact on the investment management services that we're providing. Well, this podcast is just part of a more holistic effort to not only remain in constant contact with you, but also to raise levels of awareness and understanding of the actions that we take during the year as we make adjustments to your portfolios. So at this point, I believe we can compartmentalize risk into three major categories. Clearly, you can draw dozens of subgenres under each of these major headings. At the present time, I think we have significant global risks, economic risks, and political risks that are weighing on the market at a time when we are only fractionally off the all-time record high that was established in mid-August. So let's start with global risks. China remains of concern, and frankly, I can't remember a time when China wasn't of concern. Neither the United States nor China is living up to the tenets of recent trade agreements. What bothers me, though, at this point is the seemingly new antagonistic approach being displayed by China. Two weeks ago, Taiwan escorted nine warplanes from its airspace. Last week, Taiwan again escorted 19 Chinese warplanes from its airspace. On both occasions, China shrugged its shoulders and apologized for having accidentally crossed an invisible line. Meanwhile, off the coast of Alaska, a United States flagged vessel came into contact with two Chinese nuclear submarines. At the very least, you could say that these are antagonistic examples of behavior and likely designed just to gauge a response. But it begs the question, what if China invaded the island of Taiwan? How would the world respond? How might the United States respond? Shortly after the withdrawal of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, China did make a very public overture to Taiwan, suggesting that the United States might not be the partner that they thought they had. Now, exactly what was meant by that is unclear, and whether or not it was a prelude to more hostile action remains to be seen. Russia is of concern. The situation in the Ukraine continues to devolve by the day. Now, Ukraine is surrounded by our NATO partners, and following the debacle in Afghanistan, they too are wondering about the strategic alliance between themselves and the United States. From an economic disposition, though, Russia is of greater concern today because of our dependency on their oil. Fifteen months ago, the Trump administration imposed sanctions on the import of Russian oil. On a number of fronts, Russia was not complying with various and sundry mandates, and the Trump administration imposed sanctions on its oil, among other things. Eventually, Russia did adhere to the mandates in question, and the moratoriums were lifted. However, a very large tariff was imposed on the, Ru on the import of Russian oil. Now, that was okay at the time because, well, we were self-sufficient, and honestly, we didn't need a large amount of imported oil. But today is a different story. Upon taking office, the Biden administration went back to Obama-era EPA regulations, and among other things, this imposes a higher carbon footprint tax on fossil fuel producers. This incentivized oil producers in particular to cap rigs, and thus the supply of U.S. domestic oil has declined. Royal Dutch Shell recently sold all of their assets in the Permian Basin. They are out of Texas. Foreign companies are now finding the environment for producing oil in the United States to be untenable. We can gauge the degree by which our domestic production has declined simply by looking at the volume of oil through the Cushing, Oklahoma transfer facility. That capacity has dropped by nearly 50% in just the last 12 months. So why does this involve Russia? Well, because our imports of Russian oil are higher by 150% over where they were just 12 months ago. 
uh, and this is according to information gleaned from the Energy Information Administration. The tariffs imposed by the Trump administration, though, are still there. That really doesn't make any sense. Tariffs work when you're importing ballpoint pens. It makes the Chinese counterpart more expensive than the American alternative, and the objective is to incentivize you to purchase the lower-cost American version. That doesn't work, though, when you're talking about an economically inelastic commodity like oil. We need oil, from which gasoline is a distillate. The only people uh, that these additional tariffs are hurting are those of us in line to put gas in our tanks. On the subject of oil, the Middle East now is under a microscope again uh, after the fall of Afghanistan. The Taliban, seemingly, have more in common from a culture and religious standpoint with our strategic allies in the Middle East than did the previous administration in Afghanistan from an economic standpoint. Might this undermine or otherwise threaten our strategic alliances with oil-producing countries in the Middle East? Well, that's a question that remains to be seen. It is interesting, however, that in August, President Biden asked Russia, the members of the OPEC Plus nations, and Saudi Arabia to produce more oil. Now, on the surface, to me, this seemed counterintuitive because according to tighter EPA regulations, it's not okay for the United States to produce domestic supply, but it's okay for the rest of the world to increase supply when we need it. But what bothered me and what was most unnerving about this was that all three of those supposedly strategic partners declined the president's invitation to produce more oil at a time when oil at, was near a three-year high. North Korea remains of concern. Recently, they successfully test-fired the longest-range missile to date. All right, well, no one knows for certain if North Korea is a nuclear-capable nation because inspectors haven't been allowed in that country for nearly half a decade. If any of these four geopolitical areas devolved into a crisis, then certainly it would reverberate around the world and likely have a dramatic impact on market valuations if such were to happen while we were just fractionally off an all-time high. So what about economic risks? A few weeks ago, we learned that inflation at the producer level once again recorded an all-time record high never before seen in the history of the United States. From August to August, inflation at the producer level was higher by 8.3%. That surpassed the previous all-time record high observed from July to July of 7.8%. So again, think of a ballpoint pen. The cost of producing the pen, including the ink, the plastic, the rubber, the cardboard box within which it was shipped, and the salaries of the employees who worked for the company increased by 8.3% from August to August. And just 30 days before you might otherwise buy that pen at Walmart. Federal Reserve Chairman Powell is a brilliantly intelligent person. He has multiple degrees from Ivy League schools, and you don't simply find yourself in the position of being the Fed chairman. He continues to use the word transitory to describe inflationary effects. I would like to know what his definition of the word transitory is. To me, it implies short term. Clearly on the graph before you, the red line does not reflect anything that is short-term in nature. These inflationary effects have been growing for a year. Yes, some of this can be explained as base effect inflation that comes when you're not able to simultaneously restart chains of supply, but I contend to you that, in my opinion, the majority of what we're seeing reflected here is inflation that has been created by the Federal Reserve itself in the form of a historically and exorbitantly high M2 money supply. Speaking of the M2 money supply, now you're looking at a graph of the M2 money supply. The supply of money has grown by 37% since March of last year. This is without precedent. So let this sink in. More than one out of every $3 in circulation right now have been printed since last March. None of us have ever lived long enough to witness anything like this because it's never happened before. Many of you have asked, how does the Fed resolve this? My answer is I have no idea. I have no idea what tools don't exist today that the Fed will create in the future to address a problem that we've never seen before. All I do know is that with every additional dollar printed, the rest of them become increasingly weaker, and a weak dollar is just another fancy way to express inflation. The Fed continues to print money because it also continues to be uh, 
the largest and central purchaser of United States Treasury debt. The Congress continues to spend money with impunity, and we'll get to political risks in a minute. As such, we amass greater amounts of debt, requiring further printing of money to purchase the bonds to finance the spending, so I'm not sure if the dog is wagging the tail or the other way around. However, I do know that the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate, and the most important mandate is to control inflation. I'm just not sure how you can control that inflation when you continue to print that which is creating it. Now, the Keynesian-leaning econom economists would argue that while the Federal Reserve has ballooned the M2 money supply to historically high levels, that it is having little impact on the economy because the Federal Reserve is paying an artificially high rate of interest to member banks to leave that additional lendable capital on deposit at the Federal Reserve. Now, in my opinion, that's a stretch because even if the money remains on deposit at the Federal Reserve, it is nonetheless printed. It has nonetheless debased the currency. But to the point of it being lendable, let me offer you this Pelican brief. Earlier in the year, we witnessed a sell-off in treasuries and a rise in bond yields. In my opinion, the bond market got ahead of the Federal Reserve, anticipating that tapering might occur earlier than it did. In just the last few weeks, as the market has once again anticipated the announcement of tapering, we have once again witnessed a sell-off, or at least the beginning of a sell-off in treasuries. Just over the last 30 days, we have seen the 10-year Treasury yield rise from a meager 1.1% to over 1.5%. And while this may seem like a small move on the surface, over a 30-day period of time, this is actually quite a large move. So why is this important? Well, ultimately, as the Fed begins to taper and the bond market reacts by accelerating sales of bonds and we witness a corresponding rising yield, the ability to lend money in an increasingly profitable way, will soon outweigh the artificially high rate that the Federal Reserve is paying to banks to incentivize them to leave that additional printed money on deposit. At that point, the record amount of newly printed money has indeed found its way into the economy, and that could be a catalyst for rapidly rising inflation. So try that on for size. Fed tapering, which we need, creates rising bond yields, which incentivizes banks to lend the money that the Fed's trying to keep the banks to leave on deposit. Now you're looking at the economic cycle. We have looked at this chart on many occasions in the past. Remember, I have encouraged all of you to consider this in terms of changing seasons. Think about how your behavior is incentivized by how you feel. When it's warm in the summertime, you typically wear short sleeves and shorts. When it's January and cold, you are typically wearing jeans and jackets. Right now, with inflation at historically high levels and nominal wages not keeping up with this historically high inflation, it is feeling increasingly colder. Therefore, I believe we can expect to observe changes in patterns of consumer behavior. Let me further that analogy. There's always something to wear. What you wear will be incentivized by what you feel, though. And you can apply that analogy to what we're doing in terms of investment management. Monitoring changes in consumer behavior is important because, after all, 70% of gross domestic product is consumption. It's you and I buying things. So let's take a look at the most recent read on retail sales. Notice the discernible inverted V. Indeed, as of August, year-over-year -year retail consumption is negative. This corresponds perfectly with the historical rise that we have seen uh, on inflation at both the producer and the consumer level. This is of concern to me because I believe that the market has priced into itself the likelihood that we will see a 6.6% .6 increase in gross domestic product this year. Frankly, I'm not sure how you get there, and I struggle to solve that equation on a spreadsheet. If gross domestic product is 70% consumption and your ability to consume is going backwards because your income is not keeping up with inflation, then how do we wind up with an economy expanding by 6.6% this year? If that doesn't happen, then you have to ask at what point does the market reprice that risk, especially when we are very near all-time record high levels. We can see patterns of consumption changing in big ticket items as well. Housing has been down throughout the year, and the trend for housing starts has also been negative. The consumer is increasingly unwilling to lock into big-ticket purchases that require a long-term commitment. The decline in activity in housing is perplexing because interest rates have yet to get away from us, and we've got no more of a supply vacuum today than we've had over the last 10 years. 
Clearly something else has changed to throw cold water on the appetite for such big ticket items. And I believe this perfectly corresponds with the other patterns of consumption behavior that we see while nominal income has been stagnant in the face of higher inflation. Last week, we heard from the CEOs of Kroger, the nation's largest grocery store chain, as well as Kraft Heinz and Goya Foods. All three expressed concern over the untenably high inflation of food prices. The CEO of Kraft Heinz even suggested that in their view, there are some families that are struggling with the decision over whether or not to buy prescription drugs or cheese. His quote, Please explain to me how the economy can expand by 6.6% when there are consumers so hamstrung by higher food costs that they are debating whether or not to purchase basic food staples. And while we are talking about feeling the pressure to afford economically inelastic commodities such as food, we must also keep an eye on gasoline. Fuel touches every aspect of our lives, and this commodity continues to increase in price. For reasons that we have discussed already, oil continues to move higher as a function of supply, demand, output, and also the fact that it is a commodity denominated by an increasingly weaker dollar. This will likely continue to translate into higher prices at the pump, so as you consume consistent amounts of an inelastic commodity, it will leave you with fewer discretionary dollars to spend elsewhere, and hence the decline in retail sales. In response to declining demand, we can also see in the ISM manufacturing and in the non-manufacturing indices evidence of a peak and a rollover, or at least that's the way it appears now. Yes, we do still remain in expansion territory with readings above 50, but look at the recent patterns where we have seemingly hit a peak and a rollover with a new downward trend. This trend seems to correspond to seller uh, to similar patterns that we have observed in retail sales and demand for larger ticket items like housing. We have also seen similar demand trends in industrial production. According to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, when you parse out anomalies that will not occur annually, such as the federal extended unemployment benefits, nominal W-2 and 1099 income has risen by just 0.6% over the last 12 months. So again, Parsing out things that are artificially keeping this number higher, like the child tax credit, like the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, like pandemic unemployment assistance. When you parse that out and all you're left with are nominal wages, they've barely been positive. This is the degree by which your ability to consume has increased over the last year. At a producer level, the cost of the things that you purchased have increased by 8.3% over the same time. So to me, I don't see how we get an expanding gross domestic product when there is such a negative disparity between your ability to consume and the cost of living. We haven't even begun to factor in the discussion of increased taxation. However, we are beginning to hear sound bites from committees with indications of what we might expect over the coming year. I don't believe that this is the best time in the world to embark on sweeping changes to the tax code. And among other things, increasing the corporate tax rate from 21% to somewhere between 25 and 27% on the heels of COVID, and as corporations are struggling to find employees and also dealing with the higher costs that come with base effects supply chain disruption, why would you make it increasingly difficult for corporations to continue to operate and employ people? On the political front, this Congress has promulgated over $7.1 trillion of new spending since the 1st of January. On the 14th of January of this year, the Washington Post ran with this article basically blasting the Trump administration for having spent $7.8 trillion in four years. However, the mass business media seems to regard this administration as some economic rock star for having spent $7.1 trillion in nine months. So again, hearkening back to the dual mandate of the Federal Reserve and their primary mandate to control inflation, I'm not sure how they'll be able to do that effectively when the Congress continues to spend money with impunity, requiring that the United States sink more deeply into debt and compelling the Federal Reserve to continue purchasing $120 billion a month of Treasury and agency debt, which by extension requires the printing of even more money to exacerbate an already historically large debasing of the currency. If any of these high levels of risk were to evolve into a crisis, while we are only fractionally separated from a new all-time high watermark across markets, 
then I believe such has the potential to reverberate around the world. We must be cognizant of what's happening around us and the potential for those developments to have a significant impact on our portfolios as a function of areas to which we have exposure in the market. Now, these are just a few examples of declining metrics that I can quantify and gauge by economic data. Now, let's take a look at some other points of interest that I have gleaned recently from various and sundry conference calls and WebEx meetings. If any of you have listened to the mass business media, then at some point you've probably heard the term misery index. This may seem like a counterintuitive moniker. When you're suffering through the trough of a painful period, the misery index is actually quite low. The reason for this is that because from that point, from the trough, the future looks increasingly optimistic. Said another way, things can only get better from here. Therefore, we hear words like stronger and better much more frequently than we hear words like weaker or worse as companies report earnings and make forward-looking statements. You are looking at a graphic that depicts two things. On the left, you see a bar chart that depicts net margins reported by companies across various quarters of time going back to 2012. On the right, you see a line graph that depicts the S&P 500 earnings per share against the corporate misery index. Notice the correlation between periods of time when margins are high and the misery index is also at a high point. The reason for this is because it becomes increasingly harder to outperform the previous quarter. As we're suffering through the trough of the Great Recession and the COVID recession, the outlook for the short and intermediate future looked very bright relative to the current period of time. And the potential to outperform previous weaker periods of time was greater. Today, post-vaccination, post-return of confidence, post-COVID recession, it feels like we've recovered. And net margins seemingly have recovered, and clearly they have. The question remains, though, can we continue to outperform yesterday? Notice the left graph. It appears anyway that net margins have seemingly peaked and rolled over. Notice on the far right of the line graph how the misery index is now at a point higher than at any time going back to 1984. This is just one point of data, but notice what it's suggesting. When the misery index peaks, it has historically been followed by a sharp decline in net margins. Today, we are at a high point on the misery index. We have already observed economic metrics that illustrate the possibility of consumer purchasing behavior rolling over, consistent with peaks and downward trends in the manufacturing ISM and the non-manufacturing ISM, and also consistent with declines in big-ticket purchase items like housing and also consistent with a period of time when income is not keeping pace with record high inflation. When you connect the dots of all of these individual points of observation, the picture does not look very encouraging. So what does that mean to those of you listening to this podcast? Well, I'm going to go out on a limb and make two suggestions of things that may happen over the short and intermediate period of time. First, I do believe that the market will likely experience a correction. The depth of that correction remains to be seen, but I can make a case for it being between five and 6,000 points. The catalyst for this could be any number of the things that we've discussed so far, and it will likely cause the market to reprice the risk of assumptions that had been previously made and that likely didn't come to fruition. Having said that, I also believe that this correction will be largely contained to the growth side of the market. Growth companies depend on you buying more of the thing that they produce. Well, those flourish in a consumption environment where wages are rising and taxes are low and inflation is low and you have higher velocity of money. We're not in that environment right now. With income struggling to keep up with inflation and according to the CEOs of Staples companies, consumers are increasingly finding it difficult to afford basic food items. Inflation moves higher, the dollar continues to weaken and the metrics that we have observed so far continue to point a discouraging picture in my opinion Valuations of growth companies are overly extended at this time. Now, the market will reprice that risk when today's forward-looking data becomes tomorrow's backward-looking data. To that end, if you're a client of mine, then you know that we have already taken steps, going back to the beginning of this year, to anticipate the economic conditions that we seemingly have today. As such, we revised our model allocations significantly to the value side going all the way back to January of this year. Just recently, the media has begun to flash headlines that suggest that the move to the value side of the market was well-timed. The reason for doing this was pretty simple. 
If we're not in a consumption environment where income is rising, taxes are lower, and inflation is lower, then we can make certain assumptions about purchasing activity going forward. You are increasingly less likely to consume more of that $7 cup of designer coffee, but you will likely continue to consume consistent amounts of toilet paper, toothpaste, bars of soap, and other staples items. Furthermore, we can say that historically financials and utilities seem to fare well during periods of economic decline as bond yields rise and the demand for services provided by utilities remains consistent and the dividends from both sectors are increasingly reliant. Um, uh, we rely upon the more heavily as surrogates to bonds. Furthermore, with an ever weakening dollar, anything that is denominated by that dollar should also fare well. And this would include materials, industrial and precious metals and energy. Pharmaceuticals will likely be a strong sector going forward for a myriad of reasons, including the consistency of dividends and the likelihood that we're not finished with the COVID pandemic. Having said that, I do believe that the strategic allocations and in things, including consumption of leisure, information management, and process automation technology will fare well as companies can continue to evaluate tools at their disposal to become increasingly efficient and to a large degree, this will continue to involve employing people remotely. As the Congress promulgates the latest infrastructure spending bill, I also believe that a strategic sleeve in infrastructure stocks may also serve you well going forward. As we have discussed this ad nauseum within our routine evaluation meetings, um, the second suggestion I would make is that we could see something that has never happened before over the coming 24 months. I believe that it is increasingly likely that we will find ourselves in a recession within the next nine to 15 months. And furthermore, I believe this recession will be shallow in nature and in the one to 2% negative GDP range. What makes this unusual is that I believe it could last for as long as five years. I say that because the Federal Reserve will not be able to immediately unwind that which they have spent two years creating. If they were to try to drain that which they have printed in excess of the normal money supply quickly, it would create a capital markets dislocation and everything would collapse. So this will be a very slow and arduous process. For context, remember 2008 and the incredible amount of money that the Federal Reserve printed at that time to bail out banks and put a backstop behind the economy. As of December 31st of the year 2019, the Federal Reserve had dried up only 20% of the liquidity that they had printed 11 years earlier. Well, as we saw in the previous chart, this time around they have, present, they have printed a historically large amount of money that dwarfs their actions in 2008. It could literally take decades for this to normalize back to inflation-adjusted levels. If the definition of inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods, then I suggest to you that we have that condition right now. It isn't something that the Fed will be able to turn off like a light switch, and therefore I believe we will have persistently high inflation for an extended period of time. Furthermore, wages will likely be hard-pressed to keep up with inflation that could run 200% higher than we've seen over the previous 20 years. So again, if 70% of gross domestic product is comprised by consumption, meaning you and me going to Walmart to consume random and sundry everyday things, then I believe that our ability to consume those things will be going backwards over an extended period of time. Therefore, I believe GDP will be hard-pressed to remain positive and thus the definition of a recession being two or more consecutive quarters of negative GDP, may be in our short-term future. From there, it'll be a function of how efficiently the Federal Reserve can drain that which is creating the inflation from the system. As bond yields continue to rise, I believe that will be an increasingly difficult endeavor, and therefore we may find ourselves with a shallow yet extended recession. So folks, I'm sorry for the doom and the gloom, but that's just the way it looks from my side of the desk. The good news is that I believe that we have gotten ahead of this by positioning assets largely in the defensive area of the market, where we have focused on sectors that may fare relatively well during such a period of time. Uh, we are also adding dividends and in income to the portfolio to offset the volatility of equity risk. For a great many of you, we have also adopted an expanded and refined bond sleeve as another step to dilute anticipated risk. So I want to thank you again for your attention to this relatively long podcast. Obviously, there's much going on in the world. I appreciate your trust and confidence. Please know that every day as these metrics change, I am aware of not only what the data is telling us, but also how it could have an impact on your portfolios. As you're all aware, this has been a very active trading year, and we've made adjustments to portfolios relative to your goals, tolerance for risk, and the environment within which we're working today, and we will continue to do that.
Please never hesitate to call with your questions and needs of clarity, and I will speak with all of you again soon. Thanks. David Guttery and Brandon Guttery independently offer securities and investment advisory services through Emeritus Investment Company, LLC, member FINRA, SIPC, and Emeritus Advisory Services. Information provided in today's segment is gathered from sources believed to be reliable. However, its accuracy cannot be guaranteed and should not be interpreted as tax or legal advice. Any performance stated is past performance and is not indicative of future results.